Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. And today I'm here with Inbal Shani, who's the Chief Product Officer at GitHub. Welcome, Inbal. Thank you, Carlos. My pleasure. I'm glad to have you on the show. Uh, I know that GitHub is one of those OG companies used by millions of people. Um, and also got acquired by, by Microsoft. We'll definitely talk more about that, that journey for, for the company and, and for yourself. But before, I want to talk about about you, even before GitHub, like how did you get into product? Oh, well, <laughs> you go straight in. Um, I have a weird and interesting story. Um, so I actually have my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and my master's degrees in mechanical engineering. And when I went through my bachelor's degree, I was really much focusing on the control systems because they said, if I'm in the business of building airplanes or other avionic system, I want to build the brain of those systems. So I, I did my specialization in navigation systems and control systems. Um, and then I spent 12 years in the aerospace industry, started as an applied scientist. Uh, you know, my first role was around building and tuning common filters, even before they were called AI. It was the first algorithms that you needed to tune and get the right weights to really filter the signal and get the actual solution that you wanted. Um, so I was 12 years in the aerospace industry, grew up from being an applied scientist to team lead to a manager, and then started taking more multidisciplinary roles. So I was leading one of the projects to replace avionic systems and really focusing on navigation uh, for helicopters. And I started managing uh, software engineers and hardware engineers and product management. So started playing more of a GM role only end to end. Um, and then uh, I've done that for 12 years and I got an opportunity to move from the aerospace industry to the automotive industry. Uh, I'm originally from Israel and we have needed to relocate to the Netherlands. So took my husband, three kids, went on a plane and moved to live in Holland. Uh, I had a chance to work for TomTom Tom and lead uh, groups that were responsible on location-based services and, and part of guidance. Um, and then Amazon came knocking on my door because at that time they had these magical project that was called the Fire Phone, and they wanted me to join Amazon and build Amazon capabilities around location-based services and guidance, navigation, everything that comes on the phone as a foundation for mapping. Um, so I joined Amazon and again, led a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and a month after into my job, that project got canceled. So there I was <laughs> an aerospace engineer with expertise in control system, navigation system, leading multidisciplinary team, playing GM role uh, with basically nothing to do. Um, and I needed to reinvent myself. So I started looking for different roles in Amazon that were close enough to my domain expertise, but also something that will stretch me. Um, so I stayed in the device organization and I I started doing different roles in kind of device responsible on different devices and then had a chance to launch Alexa. So that was going back to my roots in AI. Um, and then my last role in Amazon was building an autom autonomous robot, autonomous delivery robot. I was tapped on the shoulder to go do that. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, again, if you're looking throughout my career, my career was always around multidisciplinary roles, so both engineering and product. Um, I think the uniqueness that I had was my system thinking coming from being an aerospace engineer. Um, and then I went back to uh, AWS, and this time I took a role in the cloud, and I was the GM of AWS Elastic Container. So if you think about all the containers, world compute words that are not Kubernetes that AWS has built, um, was there. Um, and then I started talking to GitHub. And if you ask me, okay, so how did you find yourself as a, as a CPO in GitHub and why GitHub? Um, you've heard my story. I've been all over the stack from embedded real-time web, NLP devices, uh, robots, cloud. And the, the one common theme that was there is that developers tools are just not good enough. They're not really appealing to all developers. Each one of the developers has a very different need and someone who built that understanding, I wanted to jump in and, and help shape that future of developer tools. Um, so let me stop you there because I yeah. am fascinated by that, that moment of like, okay, you're building systems for helicopters yeah. among other things. Yeah. <laughs> then you go into building systems for <clears throat> GPS, navigation systems. Right. Then you do the same thing for phones. Yes. <clears throat> the goal going smaller, helicopter, right. navigators, phones. Smaller and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> So you definitely come from a, from a hardware 
background, there's been an inter intersection there between software and hardware. Right. How was that for you? Like, what are the angles for someone who has a strong background in hardware mm -hmm. to be able to apply some of that into software? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you think about hardware, then if you think about a device, okay, the device has different layers. There is the hardware layer for sure. And then there is a big stack of software that sits on top of that hardware. And my focus was more on the big stack of software that was sitting on top of the hardware, but really connecting the dots and understanding that um, the design of the hardware is influencing a lot how software is written, but it's also software is written influencing a lot of the hardware design. So being able to close that loop, that helps you develop that end-to-end -end system thinking. So you have to imagine yourself, what will be at the end of the cycle? How do we want to have that product look like, feel like, use like at the end of the cycle? So you can work backwards from that. I want to put a phone at the end of the customer. What are all the things that needs to happen? And that, that's the system engineering that I'm talking about. That's like the basic strongest tool that I have in my toolbox as a, as a product leader, because I can see what needs to be at the end of the development cycle. So I can work backwards from what the customer needs right now or in the future to be able to scope that into software requirements, hardware requirements, and so on and so forth. And how were you able to translate some of that system thinking approach in a hardware world where <clears throat> cycles, I, I assume, are longer yes, <clears throat> to a software world where those, short, those cycles are shorter? Um, the, the easy part in, in the software world is that cheap to learn, like your ability to ship something and iterate much faster is a faster moving cycle than when you're developing a device or, or a car or you're developing an, an avionic system for a helicopter because their experimentation has to be done a lot before you're shipping something. While when you're moving more towards kind of software as a service, your iteration cycles are much faster because you can ship a lot of the things and you can iterate much quicker which is something I was looking for. I was looking to move away from the longer development cycle to something that can deliver impact immediately. And that's what I love about GitHub. But that, that mentality of the, we're quick to innovate, we're quick to ship to learn, we're able to do that experimentation, learn from them and, and kind of revert. That was um, an interesting journey for me. And, and I think it's very interesting for other people thinking about how to get to that C-level suite as a product executive. Because there's not just one silver bullet. We, we, your story is fascinating. You come from a hardware world, systems engineering, um, but that's not the only path. So right. in your case, kind of leveraging what you have, how would you say that, that helped you now be a CPO and do things that are probably more related to managing people than managing systems? Yeah, I, I think the ability to, to learn fast and learn from every role that I've done and add these tools and skills to my, my toolbox if you think about system that takes long time to deliver and develop, you have to be very strong on your product opinion. Like you need to have a strong working backwards from a customer. You need to know what the end results need to be. And then you set a high bar for the deliverables you want to get because you don't have a lot of these iteration. On the other hand, you have to think a lot about how the system is connecting itself, how the product is connecting itself. So that's, that's an interesting tool that I had in my toolbox. And then going to cloud and seeing how basically we're scaling our compute today through the cloud, talking to customers, um, figuring out how digital transformation and the migration from on-prem to the cloud and their needs is important. Um, so I think if I'm summarizing that, the ability to have um, a quick learning and keep an open mind and be, I, I like the Amazon principle, the learn and be curious. That's something that is super critical. And I think the second thing is that if you continue being curious, if you continue doing different roles across different places of the stacks or different products, then basically you are continuing to grow your, your breadth of, um, I would say technical gut and you're developing very strong instinct, no matter what the product is, to know if it's going in the right direction or not, or what, what should be the new direction, what should be the vision, and then talking to different customers, build that skill set. Obviously, I can imagine you can think of a team or as a, as a system, but obviously when you are talking about humans, they are more complex, right? They have emotions. And, and that's something I come from an engineering background. And unfortunately, I wasn't trained on, on, on that 
those soft skills or some people will call it power skills. Yeah. I'm curious to know in your experience, how were you able to develop that emotional intelligence and that flexibility to make sure that you are bringing people along, uh, along and they can fully understand that, hey, if something doesn't go according to expectations, you have some wiggle room to, to keep them engaged. Yeah, I think that the biggest advice I was ever given when I started being a leader and that I carry today is the ability to listen. And you always have to listen to people and understand what they're going through, understand what are the challenges they're going through. Because if you want to be able to influence and drive a change, you need to know what makes someone else move. Uh, so that's, that's the one element. The second, uh, I call it radical candor right? Which is mean you have to be honest, you have to be transparent as a leader, you need to tell your team and focus a lot of the why. It's not, you know, a leadership is not a command and control. It doesn't work like that. Everyone want to feel that they contribute. Everyone want to feel they have a voice. So your way to, the, to take people with you through the journey is generate that clarity. This is where we're going. This is why we're doing. Here's what I heard from the team. Here's what we've heard from the customers. And here's where we're finding that golden path that basically everyone is marching to, to the same direction. So keeping being honest, keeping being very clear in the sense of direction while listening to people. So you make sure that they're coming with you on that journey. We had the author of the book, Radical Candor, on the podcast. We cool. spent a good time talking about difficult conversations and how right. to deliver feedback. I'm curious in your own experience, especially also coming from Amazon, a lot of their, their leadership, leadership principles, yeah. Um, how were you able to create your own principles or create an environment, not just for you to have that radical candor with your leaders, but for those leaders to also create and spread that type of culture and candor with the rest of the organization? So I, I think it's a lot about, I believe in a leadership that is uh, show, don't tell. So it's a lot about leading by example and, and expanding that circle. So it's not just how my leaders see me, but also how the rest of the organization, how the rest of the company see me operate, see me behave, see me uh, in, if it's in meetings or in conversations with customers, really creating that here is who I am, here is how I lead, here are all the skill set that I have in my toolbox, here is some of my experience, here's what I want to learn from you and how are we creating that. So it's a lot about creating these opportunities to showcase your leadership style and then seeing the reaction from people, how they're reacting to that and seeing, oh, it's okay to sit in a meeting and, and give a feedback. It's okay to sit in a meeting and, and have a conversation that may be slightly different. It's okay to challenge decision. Um, and, and really, again, focusing on, on the show, don't tell. I think that's the big one to drive the change. I, I agree. And then I think creating the right incentives to reward um, those type of behaviors, type of behaviors exactly. a long way. I've seen people being rewarded for actually speaking up, for actually pushing back. Because it's easy to say, okay, do it. Come talk to me if you have any questions. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes leading by example and saying, hey, you, like, I noticed this. Are there any specific questions you have for me? Exactly. Can create that momentum sometimes. And I can tell you that my, my Slack channel is full with people all across GitHub that are sending me feedback or they're sending me a recommendation or they're saying, hey, we heard you. Um, uh -huh. I'm talking a lot about the flywheel in the company and how you generate the momentum and figure out what is the GitHub flywheel. Um, and I got a lot of recommendation. People were actually sitting down and writing a paper that says, here is how we think about the GitHub flywheel. And they will send it to me and I will respond back and we'll have a conversation. But, but that enables that change management, that kind of how we're doing things in a more open environment and that you have that ability to, to converse with everyone in the company. I see that you joined GitHub a year ago, right? I, yeah. This is post Microsoft acquisition. Yes. I see here in the news that uh, Microsoft acquired GitHub for 7.5 billion in stock. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's an incredible platform, like the largest community for developers. I totally believe in, in that. Um, how, what, what was the status of the, 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 the product organization when you joined and where it is today? 
Um, I think that the product organization is, is a relatively new function to GitHub as a product organization. There was always product leaders in GitHub, but as kind of a, a well-founded function, um, it started in, in the Microsoft acquisition. Microsoft has a strong culture for product-led growth. And after Microsoft acquired GitHub, that culture started penetrating GitHub. So overall, our product team has started more or less, I would say, four and something years ago. Um, I think GitHub is really a strong advocate of a product-led growth mindset. And we see that with the investment that we're doing with product, with growing our product organization, uh, with growing our product marketing, our investment across the board um, in, in design and how we're thinking about uh, really working backwards from the customers. Uh, that's something that GitHub is now in the journey to. So overall, I think that um, you know product continues to grow. We are continuing to enhancing our product capabilities. So I want to double down on that because one of the things that I'm also passionate about product-led growth and mm -hmm. how we can leverage product as a, as a huge uh, growth channel for existing as well as for new users. Right. Microsoft sometimes has been um, criticized for saying, well, they have a platform, right? So in a way you put something there and it's pre-installed so people get to use it. And Microsoft yeah. Teams was the latest one. There was, I remember, a graph where people were talking about, look, Slack is the example of product-led growth. And uh, Microsoft Teams is much bigger. And it's also an example of just being there and, and uh, sometimes kind of pushing from the top. I actually yeah. believe that Microsoft has a lot of product growth as well, because in a way, this is a collaborative platform and you need to invite other people to do good work. Exactly. But still, like Slack, just to give you an example, didn't have that, that platform, right? You have hardware with, with this type of software being installed. So how are you thinking about some of those TLG motions created by github yeah and uh, how can they influence all their products within their broader microsoft ecosystem so i the way i like to think about product-led growth is really focusing on on working backwards from the customer for me product-led growth is the ability to build products that sell themselves they're so great they're so easy to use they're solving exactly what you need from them and then basically these products are having the ability to grow themselves you don't need a lot of marketing you don't need a lot of that because basically these products are doing that and if i'm talking about a recent github example copilot is an amazing example of a, of a product-led growth type of a, a solution because when we launched copilot it was the first ever type of that code complete we started with the individual and then we've upgraded to the business ability to manage copilot but if you're looking on copilot copilot is the rocket ship it's growing so fast and and the developers love it because there is a clear value there is a clear ease of use um and and you see product-led growth in its best because it was developed from anticipating the future needs of, of the customers. So that's how GitHub is operating, is really focusing on what is the need of the developers? We are a developer company that is built for developers. And our goal is to make all developers productive. Now, we are part of a, bugger, of a bigger ecosystem because the developer is not a developer, he's part of an organization, he's part of an enterprise, he's part of a business, he's part of a startup. And in order for that to succeed, it's much more than GitHub. So we're doing a lot of better together stories when we're working with Microsoft to influence that developer thinking. So how are we bringing more of that developer thinking to, to Microsoft? We have a lot of joint venture we are doing with Microsoft. If it's um, our security products that we're partnering, if it's um, the Copilot and, and Visual Studio, Visual Code that we're doing with them. Uh, so there's you'll see you'll start seeing more influencing of kind of the developer mindset on, on Microsoft and how it is operating. Yeah, and, and I actually believe that when we talk about product-led growth, it's not an either or decision, meaning right. there can be other motions that are supporting the growth for a, for a product. Yes. Uh, having a broader platform is a good thing. That doesn't mean that there can't be a PLG motion just because the product is installed in a platform. Ultimately, users need to love the product. You cannot make right. an excellent customer experience. And I believe that in this case, GitHub, uh, in, uh, but also as well as the Microsoft platform, they have the, an additional advantage to have the reach and mm -hmm. having that reach give you an opportunity to eventually create adoption, at least at the very beginning, then you have to earn that trust by the user. And one of the moves that I noticed by GitHub was that they eventually decided to make their product, uh, their, their private repositories free. Mm -hmm. And that is a power move that the startups, they, they, they can't do. And I, I 
I think it, I, I'm curious to know from your own experience, are you thinking about product pricing as a lever to increase adoption? I, I see product, I believe in input goals and output goals. I see pricing more of an, as an output goal that help drive the revenue numbers we have in mind that we want to achieve. It's more about when I'm looking into pricing is the value. What is the value that you're getting out of our product? Um, I'll go back to, to Copilot, but we can talk also about our security products. Like Copilot is going to help developers be more productive. And if you think about where developers spend their time today, there is a research show that they spend maybe 25% of their time writing code. All the rest is going to meetings, waiting on hardware, waiting on builds, um, collaboration, whatever. So 25% of their time is only spent on writing code. When we brought Copilot to the market was, okay, how can we make that 25% of their time much more productive? So we can save, let's say 35% of your time writing code using Copilot. And we have stats that shows that, you know, 35% uh, of the newly written code, historically when we launched Copilot was written by it, but now it's 60%. So we can make developers more productive. Eventually that has a price because we're making the existing pool of developers more productive. This means that we're helping companies get their shorter time to value, shorter time to market. So we're thinking about pricing through that is what is the value that we're helping and then how are we pricing it in a way to make sense of what are we are helping the companies to achieve. So that's how we're thinking about pricing. Uh, that's the lever. It's more, I want you to pay fairly for that capability that we're offering you against that value that you're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. And then I understand that developers are the main or the core user for, for GitHub. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they collaborate closely with PMs. So how can PMs also leverage GitHub in order to increase collaboration within, it, within your own product? Well, I, I think we're the best example for that because GitHub uses GitHub. Uh, our product team is using GitHub to develop GitHub. Uh, we're using PRs, we're using issues, we're using discussions, we're using projects. Uh, we're also using Microsoft tools like Power BI to develop our product. So basically we eat our own dog food. We believe that we, if we're unable to use our products to run our business, then how can we offer it to customers? So that's one element. The second thing is we need to remember that we talked about developers have only 25% of their time writing code and all the rest of their time is going somewhere else. So if we can offer a solution where a developer has a one tool that they can spend most of their time on and they don't need to leave that tool, and we can bring all the rest of the personas that are responsible in software development lifecycle into that tool, and they can collaborate using that, then basically we made our developers even more effective. And that's why we're investing in things like projects. This is why we're doing all the new AI capabilities that are spread across the platform to attract more than just the developer persona to use GitHub. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard you talk about AI multiple times and the, the co-pilot product. It's not a secret anymore. Everybody's talking about it. But I also heard you talk about how AI is not really that new. At least yeah. back in the day, I remember when I was a student in computer science, I had a class on AI. Yes. Right? And actually people didn't want to take it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we're obviously in a whole different world right now. So interested in finding practical use cases for people to start seeing value right here, right now. Can you share a little bit more about how can someone start using that co-pilot or other AI use cases and kind of get into the motion without having to learn a lot about AI or become super technical? Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned that AI has been here for a while. It's been here for a very long time, but AI historically was a niche. It was for a specific group of people that knew how to build these algorithms. They knew how to take advantage of AI. You needed to have like an advanced degree. You need to be specializing in developing AI. What we're seeing right now is the era of democratizing AI. I, I, I sometimes call it the industrial revolution of AI because basically you're making AI something that is much more accessible to everyone. And what does that mean? That means that not everyone needs to know how to learn, how to build AI capabilities, but basically you're getting the ability to build on top of that. You mentioned Microsoft building platforms. We can think about AI, the LLM model, the open AI model, even Copilot as that new platform that is AI driven. So now you can start building your application. You can start using AI without the need to know what's going on inside. You don't need to develop the models anymore. They're now widely available for you. Um, 
So you're starting seeing all these startups that are taking advantage of chat capabilities, they're fine tuning it to their needs. Or we see a lot of the companies, for example, using Copilot uh, to help advance their technology. Or we're seeing a need to help developers handling languages that are kind of disappearing from the world, you know, C developers or Cobol developer, uh, embedded developers that are really struggling, where the industry is struggling to find them because that's kind of a a very small part of the generation of developers that still exist. So you can take advantage by implying AI on top of that and the code complete, for example, to help achieve these goals for productivity. Let's say for the for the non-technical user who's been exposed to Copilot for the first time, what would be some specific examples for that person to start seeing value? I think the chat capability is likely the easiest one to start using because you're, you can use chat to really qu ask questions uh, around the code of what has been writing or uh, summarizing a PR or help me explain what is written in this function. Um, I, I think chat is a big one from the aspect of Copilot, but in general, in the industry, we see chat is becoming basically a new language for people to use search. So instead of going to like just a browser and search something, you can go to chat and you have an interactive kind of a, a conversation with an entity that enables you to source and get information the way you used to do um, when we just launched search engines. Yeah, and, and how do you see the relationship of, let's say that the PM and a chat interface when it's asking about summary for a PRD or a summary for a, a roadmap? At what point does the PM kind of trust enough to move forward? And what, what are the, the fine tuning parts or the, the tweaks that a PM is expected to do in order to bring that point home? I think what when a, when a PM is using that and is getting a summary, the expectation is that they have enough of an instinct to know what from that summary matters and don't matter. Because you get a summary. Now, how do you know that? that PR is really representing exactly what you wanted to do. So you still need to apply your instincts and your product thinking to be able to look into that summary and highlight what are these areas that as a PM, I need to go and double click maybe with my engineering partner. I need to ask a question. Okay, you chose that architecture and you've implemented that and that was this reflected. Is that the right design decision? Why have you done that? Or how is that implementation really translating into that use case that I ask you to build. So still being able to question the summary, it's just going to save you a lot of time into you know, debugging code or reading code because you are getting basically the summary of what was implemented. And now you mm -hmm. can ask more dedicated questions on the areas that you care more about. I agree. And, and I, the other point you made around the AI platform, like that layer that is going to allow users to is turbocharge their own productivity. Yeah. I believe we are the early days. Like, yes, mm -hmm. we're all talking about it now, but in reality, it's day, what, day 300, day 600 <laughs> out of an entire journey ahead of us. And, and the same way I've seen, I've seen a similar pattern in cloud when mm -hmm. suddenly companies like, like Microsoft and Amazon and others try to become that default infrastructure for the, for the developer, for the builder. I'm curious to see how AI evolves and when, what's going to be the, the, the platform play to empower a whole new generation of builders to build on top without having to worry about all the different technical details. Yeah, I, I agree. I think what, when we're thinking about AI and GitHub, you know, the first thing that we have put out there is really focusing on making developers more productive in, when they're developing software. But we're thinking about AI today as an intrinsic part of our entire platform, the entire software development lifecycle, from um, like PR that is summarizing itself to searching a documentation and really showcasing that, or how we automate actions in, in GitHub Advanced Security. Can we automate using AI and detecting of secrets or even auto fixing? So we are thinking about using AI into its full intent across the software development lifecycle. And then we also see our partners that are integrating with GitHub taking a similar approach and kind of scaling AI to their different solutions. So if we're thinking about like observability tools, can you alert on, on something that is happening, not just expect the developer to look into a dashboard or can we find something that is broken in the tool or broken in the test and, and showcasing you how you should fix that? So it's really taking AI to its full intent and its full scope and the ability to take it through the entire software development life. So. And 
But I can imagine that your calendar is packed. <laughs> no. Uh, so very curious to know what you're curious, what you want to learn these days and how you find time for it. That's a good question. Um, learn how to learn. I think that that will be my, my biggest area that I'm spending more time. You, we talked about how fast the industry is moving, how fast the world is changing. And in order to continue um, growing, in order to continue growing my skills, I have to become a faster and faster learner and figure out what are the areas that I need to continue digging into? What are these areas that I need to continue enhancing? Um, what are the new skills that a product manager or product leader will need? So it's really for me right now is investing in, in terms of learn how to learn and learn how to learn fast. Um, what are some of those areas for you right now? Well, AI is for sure number one because I've I've grown through the AI industry and I've I had the chance to play with AI when it was a niche and now in the democratizing of AI. I keep on asking myself what's next. So what is after LLM? Uh, you know, that's that's an area that I'm very curious about. You see, there's a lot of trends, there is a lot of discussions on the day after. Um, I feel we're going through a cycle. You know, we started with AI being a niche and now AI is democratized. And I think that AI democratized will eventually come to uh, um, how much you can create a general purpose platform. And then we're going back, we will go back to more combination of niche and democratize. It will never go just to a niche, but I do expect that there will be more uh, niche implementation. So that's one. The second thing that I'm, I'm really curious about learning is more about the developer experience especially in the in the day after the AI era, um, we are seeing that developers are changing and the skill sets that they need to have uh, are going to be different than if you go today to do a computer science degree, then you learn Java, you learn Python, you learn that, and then you learn a little bit of system thinking, you learn a little bit about system design, but the majority is the languages. In the world after AI, how much is language is still going to be the thing versus more the, the system design, system architecture, optimization of code. So that's an area that I'm looking into is like, what can we do? What can I do as a product leader for GitHub to think about that day after and how can we shape the, the, the new curriculum for developers? Um, so these are two areas. And then, you know, in my, in my spare time, uh, I like to paint and draw. So I try to find time to also uh, tune into my artistic side because I'm no longer an engineer that builds stuff. Love it. Well, thank you so much for your time, Imad. It's been a pleasure to, to learn from you. Same here. Thank you so much for having me.